<laughs> you gotta worry about animatronics out there trying to kill you. It's not a bird, it's not a plane, it's superhero slate. It's a modern podcast where we talk about everything that's great. Like movies, TV, superheroes. It's superhero slate. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Superhero Slate, the show where we run down the latest superhero entertainment news. We love TV, movies, and superheroes, so let's talk it all out. My name is Chris Dillard. And my name is Mike Royer. And this week, we're watching the Falcon and the Winter Soldier trailer. Well, technically, it was last week, but we did watch it again just before we hit Since record on the podcast. the so. last episode, <laughs> okay? Well, we'll, we'll, well, if you want to get sticklers, we'll do that. Um, Zach Snyder's Justice League shows tons of new footage for us to look at here. Yeah, uh, there's going to be talk, so much to unpack we're gonna, there. We're gonna, there's a lot to talk about. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, I'm unzipping the trailer right now, Mike. That's how much is in <laughs> The Last of Us cast its leads, Mike, finally, and more. Ooh, that, was, that was big news. That, that popped for about a day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was just like, bam, bam, bam. Like, rather than one announcement where, like, here's everybody, they were like, here's mm. one person and here's another person. I'm like, yeah. can you just do it all in one go, please? <laughs> We're trying to do a new show here. So, we're here we are, Mike. Uh, Valentine, happy Valentine's Day. It's just Sunday. We're 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 doing this on the Valentine's Day proper, so you may be listening to this later, but happy Valentine's Day to everybody. Yeah, our we should we should uh, say thank you to our uh, illustrious wives mm-hmm. for giving us a moment to uh whip open in the recording studio and uh take a uh, take prime Valentine's afternoon day and uh talk about uh nerd stuff. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty much. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, I'm thankful for that. But uh, you know, at the same time, what we were talking, I was like, you know, the only person I talk to probably more than my wife is, in fact, you. So uh, oh. we got that going for me. <laughs> Mike, will you be my Valentine? All over. No, oh, of course I will. What's the Valentine's card? Okay, because you got to put yourself in the mindset of like buying Valentine's card when you were uh-huh. a kid. You know, they're always like that, like. I don't even know if they're cardboard or they're just thick card stock. Yeah, it's and they're always perfor. You always got to unperforate them, yeah. and then. I always remember like, oh, like, oh, I want to get like Spider-Man Valentine's cards yeah. or something like that. And then you expect like, because at the time you're thinking like to- uh, Toby Maguire Spider-Man, but you're just getting like these like random like drawings of Spider-Man. Like, no, I want the Toby Maguire yeah. Spider-Man well, Valentine's. To, That's my Spider-Man at the moment. To be to be a child in, in these Valentine's days, they have all the options. Uh, you know, <laughs> my wife, again, um, she teaches uh, young children uh, age 10 or less and they like she's like oh I, I get i send my kids valentine's you know, i'm like oh, that makes sense they're all they'll have the thing and i'm like go looking at them like they have avengers they have spider-man they have uh star wars you name it they got it man like a mandalorian pack of of valentine's cards i'm like man this is awesome i wish i wish this would have been around when we were kids you know, and I, no kid would ever complain about a holiday that could possibly give you candy. Yeah. But it's weird, though, because unlike, uh, you know, you know, Easter, whether you're religious or not, usually there's candy involved. And, uh, you know, there's definitely unfettered candy at Halloween. But Valentine's Day, there's always the, the chance of heartbreak, depending uh-huh. on your age. You know, is it going to be childhood heartbreak of just like your crush in like second grade didn't give you a card the way you wanted it? Or you could be uh, middle aged and alone on Sunday and just eating a eating just candy bars by yourself on the couch but uh you know what you're here with us and we'll yeah. be your valentine and, today. and i'm gonna take my my favorite valentine's card and uh i chew 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 oh, you. i knew it i knew it I knew <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah the old the old classic simpsons one so so i that's what i got going on mike what have you been up to how have you been spending your, your week? Well, I mean, I've just been uh, cooling off, I would say, from the Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, what a what a letdown it was uh, last week. I mean, we kind of got one thing to really talk about from the Super Bowl, and that's going to be at the top of the show. Mm-hmm. But just, like, overall, like, I was bored. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, my Me and my wife just kind of sat through it just to technically be completionists. Like, technically, if you're really watching it just for the commercials and the trailers, you have to stick around until the two-minute warning in the fourth quarter because I feel like that's really the last premium commercial spot that they sell. You know, after that, it's well, it repeats. You might even see repeats. That's, you know? that's, a, that's a very... Um what I would call a potluck scenario, right? You're either <laughs> you're either really close, and that's a really intense quarter, last two minutes, mm-hmm. uh, and and everybody's watching, or the lead's so far gone that nobody's watching. And I believe that's what happened this year. So I believe we <laughs> yeah. did get repeats. I couldn't, to be honest, other than the Falcon and the Soldier, I believe there was a Raya in the Last Dragon trailer. 
I mm-hmm. don't remember what else was really shown. Um, yeah, because we were we were trying to decide on the night, you know, oh, are yeah. we going to do a part two episode and talk about the trailers and the commercials? So I even had like a yellow legal pad and every commercial break I was writing down like the commercials like worth talking about because, you know, sometimes it's hard to find a list that's published that same night. Usually you can find them on Monday. So I was making that list and about like maybe like halfway through the second quarter, I was just looking at this and I'm just like, there's been like one trailer and then I looked at our show notes, uh, another plug for the show notes at superhero slate.com. I looked at our superhero show last year and there was so many trailers last year. There was like at least a dozen. And then on top of that, there was like, you know, other types of like reveals for other things that weren't necessarily movies. And like this year, it's like, we just have Falcon and the winter soldier to talk about. So it was like, yeah. So that's why you didn't hear us twice mm-hmm. last week, but we got some fun stuff to talk about this week. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and and I think I think that's uh everyone knows this. It's it's easier, it's cheaper to just try to get a buzz word of mouth by putting it online and you know, we'll talk about that with the Falcon and the Soldier. We got a small snippet of the full mm-hmm. trailer. They were like, "Go watch it on YouTube." I'm like, "Done. All right. Let's, let's I don't need to see anything else to hear. Let's go let's go check it on YouTube." So, I think a lot of people will talk about another movie that got a trailer uh this week uh later on that, you know, probably rather than buying a Super Bowl spot for $5 million, uh was able to be smarter and just put it online and uh get word of mouth that way. So, mm-hmm. it's it's easier. They're lear- they're learning the internet is isn't uh all uh is is a better place to be than the tv sometimes but (laughs) yes but at the top of the show we'll jump into the corn stream real quick because i don't know what we're gonna call it once this pandemic's over but corn stream just is still rolling off the tongue so uh we we watched three movies this week and one of them will cross over and we'll, we'll talk about it maybe a little bit in length uh here in a moment but uh the first movie is this film called the assistant which came out in 2019 which is uh, now streaming on hulu which my wife has been apprehensively wanting to watch because she has been an assistant for multiple people at different companies out here in hollywood so she knew that this was going to be a little bit of a triggering film so we went into it you know uh, you know, being a little guarded, and it, it was a it was a very slow burn film. Uh, this is very much about the day in the life of one assistant, and uh, they get all of the little things right. And like you know, like you know how we're always that Leo meme uh, from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood that's pointing at yeah. the screen, like pointing at like cameos. She's doing that, just like look, look, look. You see, she's in the she's in the break room cleaning the dishes, and the other employees come in and just leave their dirty dishes, and she has to clean. Them. I've had to do that. I've had to, so I, that was kind of humorous in a way of just like it was uh, it was is a tragedy to watch this uh, this woman just basically getting beaten down in this film. And there's like kind of like this mysterious Harvey Weinstein type boss that's kind of mysterious that you don't really get to see through the film. But uh, I guess uh, light spoilers, if you will. I don't really know if this is the type of film I have to worry about spoiling on the podcast. But about halfway through the film, you kind of start to get the idea of what type of movie this is and maybe how the ending is going to go or not going to go. So maybe don't watch it for uh, the conclusion. You just kind of watch it for the vibes that it's going to deliver your way. So if you've ever been an assistant before, especially in anywhere adjacent to Hollywood, I think The Assistant uh, now streaming on hulu is, is gonna make you feel certain ways yeah on hulu and you said 20, who, who was the actress in that i'm i i honestly can't remember her uh, name but she was she's like uh a care she's a seasonal character in the americans because you know uh we're binging that right now and we were like oh hey the chick that stars in it she was in that season of the americans so i haven't recognized her myself from anything else but uh, you know, you can see her on The Americans yeah. if you want to see her someplace else. It looks like her name's Julia Garner. I don't know her. I, I was thinking of another movie, I guess, uh, with the no, with okay. actress. So, yeah. Yeah, but that's The Assistant. And then uh, we also watched just today on Valentine's Day part three of To All the Boys I Ever Loved series, which is that Netflix kind of high school romantic comedy. And the third one is called To All the Boys colon always and forever and uh we we only knew about it because uh andy gets marketing emails from netflix and they were like oh they added the third film on netflix we should watch it this weekend so i was like all right valentine's day sounds like the perfect time to watch it and when we went to hit play we had to pause it instantly because we were like wait did we watch the second one what happened in the second one so we had to look up a synopsis and we're just like 
Oh, yeah, this kind of sounds familiar. So I guess that's not really a glowing review for the franchise if you can just easily forget what has happened so far. But it's a, it's a fun little movie. You know, if you're looking just for a little rom-com, want to remember what it's like to be a teenager. If you have other other teenagers or younger people in your household, you know, mm-hmm. you know, it's a fun, it's a good time. You know, there's some there's some interesting things that happen in the film. It, but, you know, it's Valentine's Day. You know, it was it was an easy decision to make. It, it was one of the so so today i was working on uh cleaning up some of the stuff i've been working on the past you know couple weeks months and uh, my wife was watching 10 things i hate about you in the background Mm -hmm. and i maybe watched a third of it uh maybe even less a quarter of it but i could hear the whole movie while i was working back and Mm -hmm. forth and i was like is that what high school was like like that (laughs) bad like i'm like oh Oh. kind of cringy like oh chris this this movie right here will make you feel so old. Not just because, like, oh, it's teenagers, like, using apps and, like, texting and, like, FaceTiming and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But there's, like, a moment where the couple is trying to f- talk about what their song should be. And the boyfriend recommends an Oasis song. And she's just like, oh, our song will never be a song from the 90s. And then I thought about it. I was like, they weren't even born in the 90s because they're, like, supposed to be 17. And I was just like, oh, my God, I've never felt so old where, like, the 90s is, like, a decade that they have no physical connection to. So that was a little triggering for me. Uh, So, (laughs) but anyway... These two movies basically were to build up goodwill to force my wife to watch this third film, which we both watched last night, Chris. Mm-hmm. And, and and here's the thing. I believe I promoted this movie several months ago um, whenever I was on my um, uh, what was it, jujitsu kick. This this trailer <laughs> came out the same week. And obviously I didn't I didn't I kind of went under my radar because, you know, it's on like this movie. You can purchase it on Amazon. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah, twenty bucks on Amazon. I don't believe it's connected to streaming uh, catalog. Yeah, I, I, and and I'm gonna I, I'm just gonna go ahead and, and play our cards here. This is Willie's Wonderland, Nicolas Cage's essentially Five Nights at Freddy's movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, and um, don't don't spend the money, folks. Uh, <laughs> if you can avoid it, do not spend that twenty dollars. Uh, I'm not gonna bury that lead at all. But um, yeah. we both we both had the pleasure. <laughs> of watching this movie what what a trip that was you know honestly i went in with extraordinarily low expectations which is the right way to go and i didn't spend any money to watch it because through means of sharing files and certain plex servers i was able to watch it for free and i would say for the cost of free 99 (laughs) or possibly in the future when a streaming service buys it and you can just watch it for free Honestly, I think I would recommend it just for a, just some dumb laughs, right? Um, I oh. actually surprisingly think the first kind of 30 minutes of this movie is actually really solid. Like, I was very surprised. Like, the whole shtick of Nicolas Cage being a silent protagonist was actually really funny mm-hmm. because he had to rely a lot on these looks. And there were some of these, like, southern kind of backwoods characters that are in this film that I actually thought gave solid performances. Like, the tow truck driver the way he just kind of rambles on and on and on i was like this is actually working for me you know everyone's kind of just like dumb and oblivious but it's kind of fun uh it really kind of starts going off the rails once they kind of have to flex the the budget and the the skill of the director right like the action scenes aren't I wouldn't even use the word action to describe them. It's just like a man trying to push over somebody in a mascot costume, (laughs) but then they just move the camera really fast to try to make it seem like something exciting is happening. (laughs) So I'm going to go ahead and and tell you this as uh, someone who went to film school, they use an anamorphic lens to film. Oh this. God, the edges of the screen. Everything were just like, what is, is warped. Uh, like people are stretched. People are uh, like, uh, well, what's the effect? When it's red and blue. Um, uh, I forget what it's called. An- was it like anamorphic? Uh, no, that's what you just said. Yeah, uh, no, anamorphic a, is the lens. Abbrevia, like, cr- chromatic abbreviation. Yeah, is that what cr- it is? chromatic aberration. Yeah, yeah. Uh, aberration. So like, like the reds and blues aren't lined up. Everything is twisted at the end. I'm like, I'm pointing. I'm like, my, I'm like, my, I'm like. Like point at the TV and I'm like, look at that curve. Like that's <laughs> supposed to be a straight road. Look at the curve. So it's like someone used an extra wide lens and then cropped it to the sixteen by nine or whatever the uh the film ratio is there. And it, it, it took me out of it a couple times. But man, Nicolas Cage as it literally saying no words this entire film is just a riot as he's 
mm-hmm. of the unassuming man who's drinking punch pop and playing <laughs> pinball the whole like that's oh, that's what that he was scene, doing. That last pinball scene where he's like really getting into mm-hmm. it and he's like dancing and I was like, "Oh yeah, this is this is fun." What, why <laughs> what did, why did he drink the punch pop on a timer? Okay, I have an explanation for this. So I guess light spoiler warning here, uh, but I mean, this this is not this type of movie, people, okay? Yeah. Uh, you can look at the time codes if you want to jump ahead to our Falcon and Winter Soldier news segment, but I found a fan theory online, which seems to be really solid you in its up, reasoning. You Googled this afterwards. It's, I, I, I love had, this about I, you. I had to know. So, uh, ba- so based on this theory, none of this is included in the movie, and I believe that's a flaw of the storytelling, mm-hmm. but I, I think this is a good explanation of what's happening is, is early on in the movie nick cage learns what's happening he's smarter than he looks he's not just like a dumb oaf just like following through the motions he understands that he's caught up in some sort of weird satanic you know ritual pact thing and and in order to survive he needs to follow the rules of the world that's given to him in order to uh make it out alive right that explains why he never uh proactively fights one of these animatronics Mm -hmm. he's only allowed to kind of defend himself in order to take them out out. and also it explains all the punch pop because i thought it like i was like is this some sort of weird like diabetic story where he has to make sure he gets his pop or is he trying not to fall asleep because he is an insomniac and he needs caffeine but i guess the boss the texas the texan guy at the beginning says make sure to take your breaks so that's what he's actually doing is his watch is telling him to take his break and that's oh. why he goes into the kitchen drinks his pop so, and plays pinball so i i think that's i think that's what's happening here is so, he knows that there's a ritual at stake and he needs to adhere to it in order I, I guess theoretically that you know these things maybe can't be killed if you don't follow the yeah, rules maybe I'm, they just come back to life I'm going to be honest this person and, and you have given a lot more thought to this movie than I think the people who wrote the <laughs> no, film no I have given no thought to it I just read <laughs> well, what read. they typed out so, on the internet and so I'm just regurgitating it to I, you I did notice and, and wrote this down that the can of, of the soda says a fistful of caffeine to the kisser <laughs> I thought I thought we were gonna find out that Nicolas Cage was getting maybe like his, his some super strength or like like jacked up by drinking these. So he was <laughs> he was like keeping like his like like he was gonna fight one of the uh, the the little uh, fairy looking one right. Uh huh. And he's he's like his buzzer went off. He's like hold on, gives it to her, and he goes and drinks the soda. I thought he needed that. Like to me, it's just from inferring it. But I, I get what you're saying now. It's like he was like drinking this to like. Like a can of kick ass, like is what he was opening every time he did this. Because he drank one and then would literally destroy an animatronic because uh-huh. he, he was able to drink it. But I mean, this movie is is literally Five Nights at Freddy's. He's trapped in a building with um, possessed animatronics at like a mm-hmm. Chuck E. Cheese ripoff. And uh, the, the the only like the unbelievable part is the other characters, like the children. <laughs> in this like the girl the he's just like he just like lets her get in his car when he leaves he's like and then he's like here have a soda i don't i don't i don't know man this it was just wild watching watching willie slice the sheriff like at an angle with his hands oh and her God. body torso just kind of fell off that that was a great moment because it had there'd yeah. been a little bit of a lull in the movie till yeah. something like really kind of uh, uh like amazing had happened uh-huh. so that was uh that was a, a refreshing yeah. breath but you got to know exactly the type of movie you're getting into when you hit play and it says an hour 28 minutes this does not even reach the 90 minute threshold of most films that make it like direct to vhs back at blockbuster back in the day so i i had to go online to see what the reception was and i was shocked to see people like going hard at it like it was like they were reviewing a nolan film i was like what what on earth did you people expect oh, nicholas yeah. cage in a in a, a ripoff of Fri- five nights at freddy's so this actually does give me a little bit of hope for the Blumhouse movie that they're making just because the Blumhouse film, you know, they're going to have probably a more competent director and they'll probably have more money on top of it as well. Mm-hmm. Because honestly, I think that this could have been schlocky gold if like the if the action scenes would have been top notch. They could have been just as cheesy, but like if there was actually maybe some sort of choreography to it and not just people in like suits, you know, just pretending to move like a robot and they use the little yeah. robot sound effects on them but like yeah if you threw some more money at those things you know i think you could have schlock gold but now it just kind of feels like schlock bronze well it's 
this is a a an o uh, an homage, if you will, to 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 those B movie horror films from the eighties, right? Like literally, Ooh. like feels right out of the eighty kind of thing. Uh, and Nicolas Cage, of course, put himself in a role where he is the badass for the whole thing. Like he gets a lot of cut in the first fight, and that's you know, like he puts duct tape on it. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm like, okay, that's that's fine. Um, but I I think literally like this would. Um, I think this will have like a small cult following just because of it, it is bad and everyone takes themselves seriously. Uh, but my wife looked over me at one point. She's like, why is this girl telling us the plot of the movie? I'm like, well, they need someone to. Who else is going to tell us the yeah. plot of the movie? <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I, I think it will get some cult followings. It's nothing good. I would not pay $20 for this unless you're oh, like, you, Lord, no. you have a party or like a, like a blow up theater screen. You're going to have like a bunch of people watch with, but I don't recommend group gatherings. Uh, but like you look at us up, I looked up the, it's a budget of five million dollars. I'm like, I feel that, I could do this. Yeah, <laughs> so. they didn't do too bad for five mil. No, no, and it, I, this is just another push. If you can go find a a, a non way to pay and, and watch jujitsu with Nicolas Cage, go watch that <laughs> one. Like it's he's he's leaning into these B movie schlocky films. So I'm 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 excited. I'm yeah. excited for you to yeah. see that one, Mike, and get that. Feedback. Well, I, I think we've both yet to see it, but the film that everybody keeps rec- recommending if you want kind of like crazy Manic Cage is this film called Mandy, which came out just a few yeah. years ago. And I've, I've yet to see it, but apparently that's kind of like top-notch Crazy Cage, so maybe we'll get around to watching that eventually. I, I believe, I mean, people like actually enjoy that one, right? I mean, isn't that... Yeah, the... it's like I've, I've heard it's pleasurable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, yeah, it's fine. So yeah, that was a, that's great to have a kickoff... Uh, middle of february with willie's wonderland five years ago we were celebrating with deadpool uh mm-hmm. and now now we got this movie but it's fine i mean it's good all right let's kick it off mike we've been we haven't talked about this at all all week I, seven days mm-hmm. of not talking about this the falcon and the winter soldier trailer uh landed during the super bowl was a small preview full ones online link is in the show notes uh i did pull some see some stats here on monday 125 million views in the first 24 hours which makes it the biggest trailer uh, for something debuting on a streaming service ever. Yeah, that that's pretty rad. I would imagine probably the only thing that's going to compete with that moving forward is other Marvel streaming stuff, of course, yeah. and you know maybe like the next season of Stranger well, Things or something yeah. like that. You know, it, it also depends. Uh, are, will the HBO Max trailers count towards this? Because I believe Matrix Four could possibly have a large trailer following. Oh yeah, that could be too. Um or or something like that um that ends up going there. So yeah, but I mean, I think that's good. I think I think this was fun. It it, it uses some of the same footage we saw last year's Super Bowl mm-hmm. trailer. Uh they're not really giving us a uh, US agent at all. They are holding that off the screen very very heavily. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's I don't really know if it's just an observation or maybe more of a critique of the trailer, but after I watch it, you know, obviously I'm hyped. You know, I'm very yeah. excited to see these two characters. They they do a really good job highlighting in this trailer their more of their relationship of their antagonist and the whole staring contest bit yeah. towards the end of the trailer is so ludicrous. It's so funny. It's so great. But really, we we don't really have a lot out of this trailer, right? I think we get a little bit of Zemo saying mm-hmm. that there should be no more superheroes. So yeah. I guess we're kind of getting his motivation moving forward. We see like a couple shots of what might be maybe some of his henchmen or yeah. what, who's who's the woman in the mask? So Does she have a name by now? Yeah, it's Erin Kellyman. She played Infy's Nest in uh, the Solo uh, movie, but the, uh, her character is Flag Smasher uh, from the comic books who who's essentially a Captain America um, antagonist. Yeah. So, uh, but beyond that, we don't. I, there's really not so much to pull out out of here, right? I mean, uh, we got to see Falcon in the teaser trailer a few weeks back. Well, I guess yeah. it's not a few weeks anymore. That was a Two while months. ago. It was back yeah. last year, uh, where you know he was flying through the canyon. Uh, this time around, we get to see him use his wings, block some bullets, which is pretty badass. We get to see Bucky cling on to the side of a, a semi mm-hmm. with his arm. He still has the Wakandan arm, which is still such a badass look and, with and that a hair, black and, and a haircut. Oh yeah, his haircut. I like that haircut. Like I'm gonna need like a lot of men, uh, and I sh- and also women in general are going to need uh, haircuts here soon once this pandemic's over. And mm-hmm. I'm eyeing that one on top of uh, Bucky's head. That looks pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I mean yeah, like I wish there was like some more juicy bits that we could uh, that we could sink our teeth well, into. But of course, I'm excited for this. Yeah, I'm gonna give us I'm gonna give us two bits here that I noticed. Uh, the first one is it looks like the Falcon and. And Bucky, Sam and Bucky, are both government-sanctioned now um, mm-hmm. because last time we saw them, again, um, 
the government wanted to uh, capture both of them, right? Like one was left mm-hmm. in Wakanda hiding, and the other one is on the run with Captain America. Um, so what? How do how do they both now get government sanctioned? Is it like because they're part of the Avengers, and the Avengers are, you know, um, save the day against Thanos? What does that landscape look like to get them back working with the military on these missions? Right, like that's that's what I want to know because. Last time we saw them, the government wanted to kill them both <laughs> and get rid of them. So I'm interested to see how that plays in. And then also I was thinking about it, and I was I was talking about this out loud uh, the other day, is that the, 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 the shield that the Falcon has is not from this universe, if you will. Uh, because Captain America's shield was technically split in half at the battle uh, in Endgame. And literally... While they're cleaning up that battle, Steve goes to take the Infinity Stones back and then shows up with another shield. So where did that shield come yeah, from? But, but I guess we do probably need to watch our words just because I know what you're saying. You're saying universe, but I think technically we might need to say that's from a different branch of the timeline but, but, because we still don't have we we still don't technically have word yet if when you know the whole sorcerer supreme when she did those whole branching past to kind of show bruce banner what's happening right huh. we still don't technically know if one of those branches is going to considered a universe uh in addition to the multiverse or if it's just a separate timeline so well yeah it could they, be uh, it's otherworldly that's for yeah sure. it, it's, it's from not a different... yeah it's not from this moment in time because that one was destroyed uh, mm-hmm. And I believe the Russos or the or the writers, one of the two, was like, "Yeah, um, technically, Steve living with with Peggy would create a a, a branch, if you will." Um, mm-hmm. So that that he may have brought that over, I don't know. So we're gonna, I, we're gonna figure out where this came from. Maybe that's part of the MacGuffin, this this shield that shouldn't exist in this world at some point. Um, oh, no, maybe. I did notice, uh, or, or I didn't notice. I saw articles about this. The uh, dormant in humans TV show Twitter account reactivated itself. To share this trailer uh they've oh, not been active since that show <laughs> so are there technically inhumans in this show uh we have miss marvel coming up will mm-hmm. um and then uh what's his name uh zemo killed super powered people in russia at the end of uh, civil war right is mm-hmm. his goal to create more super powered people to fight the superheroes that's why maybe yeah. flag smasher can take them on yeah, I mean, this is a this is a big question, right? And I'm sure uh, you are prepared to uh, follow up and answer and keep track of all the details moving forward. It's just the Inhumans in general, right? Of course, it would be very, very, very easy for any MCU fan or even the executive producers over there at Marvel to totally write off the Inhumans TV show, right? Mm-hmm. It, it barely went for a full season. No one really watched it. Like, you could... Sh- push that under the rug and you could easily recast Black Bolt in the future and we'll just act like that never happened, right? But technically they were already introduced in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and at one point in time, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was indeed canon to the MCU. They were running very parallel from movie events affecting the TV show and yes, eventually towards the end of the show, they branched off into crazy, totally different timelines. You know, they're they yeah. You could consider them being in their own multiverse when they went to the future and the space and all of that craziness. But the Inhumans in, in Agents of Shield that was that happened before all of that crazy branch off happened. So really, if we think about it, do they need to reintroduce the Inhumans? Are they going to play along and say like, oh yeah, no, all that stuff happened. Uh, Shield knows about the Inhumans. They they dealt with a bunch of stuff, you know. But here's all the files on all the things I, that like Quake and everyone did. I think again, knowing Kevin Feige to have control over this and not have to worry with what Jeff Loeb was doing over there, mm-hmm. uh, would just negate it. Like now, that's we it, we're going to acknowledge multiverses. That's now a different multiverse kind of thing. Uh, and that'll probably be the easiest way to do it, right? Like that's that mm. seems to be the best way because then you know the royal and humans like, god damn, do they fuck that up pretty hard? Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and I I don't want to I don't want to go back through that and watch Shield and be like, oh, they their Shield contradicts the MCU. Like, what do we do about this? You know, which one do we take? Uh, f- you know, for real. So I I hope they just say, d- get rid of it. But I hope also at the same time they do reintroduce in humans in a way. And I believe there may be some ways for them to do that. And we will talk about it at the end of the show, uh, if that gives you any indication of what we will be talking about. Um, but you know, I, again, I I've heard whispers of the show having a some sort of a, one of the episodes or possibly multiple dealing with a virus of some kind. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 
hence that's why uh, again the, the beginning of Civil War uh, the Crossbones Rumlow his team is going to get the virus or whatever that, that mm-hmm. kills people this may tie into this show uh, why they were getting the virus rather than just that be a random event uh, for, of terrorism so um, we'll see I, I, I hope I hope to find out more that this does debut March 19th uh, as soon as WandaVision wraps up we get a week off and then the show and I'm thrilled I'm excited to see this Mike that's uh, even though it's six episodes, uh, we don't have to wait, what is it, eight weeks, two months to watch it, like where we are right now with WandaVision. So, yeah. yeah, we're about a month away. Uh, about a month away. I'm down for that. Uh, fun fact, I forgot about this show. Disney, I believe XD, is doing a uh, Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur uh, show, uh, animated. And the artwork looks really cool. We got our uh, some new, looks like maybe key art or is still from the show here, with uh, Moon Girl uh, cleaning Devil Dinosaur's teeth. <laughs> and, uh, it looks pretty fun. It looks like it looks like a Disney animated kind of thing. Um, reminds me of that. But uh, also, they did some casting announcements for us. Uh, actress and singer Diamond White from The Lion Guard uh, will star as Lunella Lafayette, who is Moon Girl. Uh, and I forgot about this, but uh, Lawrence Fishburne is a um, producer on the show and will voice the Beyonder. Are you familiar with the Beyonder? Uh, I don't. I don't think I am familiar with Beyonder. Maybe if I, maybe if I gave a look at him, he'd look familiar. But don't, yeah, don't so him. so he is the essentially a antagonist, uh, main person of the Civil, uh, Secret Wars series from the eighties. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He looks familiar now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I know this guy. Yeah. So he is essentially from the Beyonders. They are mentally b- beyond the universe kind of thing. Uh. So um, I, he's very powerful. He can do lots of things. Uh really his, his power is unlimited but like you know the fact that they're gonna even acknowledge him in the show is pretty big deal like that's an obscure character to pull out and put in a kid show uh by all means um but then some other some other casting announcements are here again alfrey woodard who was in luke cage uh um and then what she was also in i believe civil war she was in civil war as well uh as you know lunell's grandmother i don't know the rest of these characters uh, that well uh, fred tataskior who's like usually the voice of uh the Hulk and all the other cartoons uh, will be Devil Dinosaur, of course, and uh, Gary Anthony Williams uh, as uh, Lunella's grandfather pops. So I, I'm looking forward to this. I kind of want to see this a little bit, see what goes on. Um, yeah, I, I I would imagine if this is a Disney Channel or Disney Channel XD, it will pop on Disney Plus eventually. Yeah, I assume there might be like a delay, or they could do same day. I don't know. I mean, um, those those Mickey Mouse shorts they did for a while were on youtube and then on the streaming service at the same time it was weird so uh yeah i, I this slate to come out in 2022 i'm excited i want to get a trailer do you think maybe they'll give us one this summer if marvel does an event in place of Man, uh, uh who knows the the comic-con news is already starting to trickle out that i believe WonderCon has now been canceled yeah. they're they're committing to a very robust WonderCon at home situation so now people are just waiting to see what's gonna happen with comic-con and i i I don't think it's going to be good, folks. Do not cross your fingers for July to go our way. Yeah, <laughs> for mass for mass gatherings of people, right? Yeah, no, I I I'm feeling the same way. I was looking at hotels for C two E two, and that's in December, and I'm like, they've not really, they've not even opened up their hotel blocks yet for that. So, and mm-hmm. they have a date. I'm like, well, we'll see as we get closer. Oh well, well, hopefully we'll have a good online event for Marvel. That last that Disney one was so good though in the, in the fall. <laughs> Uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. I believe we're going to be talking about this quite a bit in the next coming year, if, if mm-hmm. at all. But Chris Evans is rumored to return to the MCU, but as two roles. Two roles. Yes. All right, what's the juice here, Chris? So first and foremost, uh, if you're going to do a multiverse acknowledging previous Marvel films, bring him back as Johnny Storm from Fantastic Four, <laughs> that, right? That's that's true. That makes sense. Uh, that's what everyone knew him as beforehand. And then also, he would, of course, be coming back as Steve Rogers, but with a twist. The Hydra storyline where he's evil Captain America working for Hydra. So, oh, well, that that comic arc that was like what that was like three or four years ago or something. Yeah, I think, where he was supposed to be bad, but then of course he actually wasn't bad because they always they can always rewrite he, that he, stuff. Well, he was he was bad, but like the the cosmic cube and that universe was like essentially split him into a good version and a bad version. So, uh, but yeah, so like literally, they, I, I think if they're peeking into multiverses, they could really have him for a couple seconds. Where like here's a here's a world where Captain America was evil, and here's a mm. world where he was. You know, this is a Fantastic Four with Johnny Storm, um, and not really have to do a whole movie about these. So, 
I think that's pretty fun. I mean, I, I, I don't want it to be just a clip show. Hey, here's all the things we've done before, but you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, fun. I, I get, I guess it makes sense, right? You know, if there's going to be this uh, ability for all of these possible Spider-Men to return. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, you got Chris Evans in the pocket, bring him back and, as Johnny Storm. And well, I mean, again, Disney own X, uh, the, the Fox, uh, you know, franchises. So they technically own that fantastic four stuff now. So, uh, they could use clips, but if they brought him back, I think it'd be even funnier. I mean, that was one of the things about Thor: The Dark World I enjoyed when Loki turned into him, Captain America, like out of mm-hmm. nowhere, and like that was kept secret forever. That was, that was a really good epi- that was a really good scene in the movie. So, um, yeah. I think I think it's just honestly safe to say, narratively for the MCU moving forward, it makes no sense to bring back Chris Evans as like as Steve Roger. He had such yeah. a great send off in Avengers Endgame. As much as you want the character back, it doesn't make any sense for him to bring back. He has no unfinished business. Well, so I'm gonna disagree. Just don't because oh, okay. well, <laughs> I think I think there's a one off series of six episodes where he's returning each Infinity Stone back to his original home. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I guess like, but, but, but technically like, that's a that's a prequel though. Well, right? well, well like just like it's kinda like Loki's story, right? Like it, it's it's uh-huh. a prequel, but it's like what did he get up to in that meantime? Like, I don't care. I, he doesn't need to come. I, I agree with you. He doesn't need to be in the current Marvel Cinematic Universe, like the here mm-hmm. and now. But, like, I would love to see him come back and do that show of, like, how did, he, mean, how did he get those back? I'm sure Feige and Marvel would be happy to have him. And I'm sure he doesn't need any leverage over at Disney. You know, he's a made man over there. But yeah. we do know that one brief moment when he when he was talking about, you know, not being in the MCU anymore, there was uh, reports of, you know, him wanting to do his own stuff and make his own stuff. Yeah. So I'm sure like he's got I'm sure he's got some sort of overall deal over at Disney where, you know, he can write and direct and make whatever he wants to oh. make, you know, outside of superhero stuff, I'm sure. So, uh, yeah, I'm sure he can walk in that door and talk to any of the bobs whenever whenever he wants. Yeah, yeah. Or if Kevin's like, hey, we need to do this show with these stones. You want to come back? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. It sounds like a good time. I just think it'd be fun to have. I mean, I agree. He doesn't need to be in the here and now. Like, just like we don't need to bring Tony Stark back from the dead, right? Like, we don't mm-hmm. need, I mean, we don't need that. So the only other thing I would give him is if they aged him, if they needed the old Captain America to, like, pass on some words of advice that they could mm-hmm. do that and then pass kind of like how they did with what was her name uh, 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 Peggy Carter in, in uh, Winter Soldier where she was like on, mm-hmm. her, on, on her not her deathbed but she was in a hospital kind of thing so it'd be, it'd be interesting but yeah I agree like you don't need it like we're not we don't need a future storyline where Hydra takes over the world like we already tried that so Justice League this is what you guys are here for right everyone's Ooh, here to talk and, and, and hear about Justice League uh, the, the tr- uh, so earlier in the week we got images of Jared Leto's Joker in the Snyderverse. Uh, and, and we talked about this a little bit, right? Like, you know, um, what, what did you say? Nobody does deranged or haunting like Jared <laughs> Leto does. And mm-hmm. I agree. Like this is, this is not i uh, I'm going to point out, this is not a damaged Joker, right? Uh, his tattoos are gone. He's got a scar on his face and he's wearing the very um, Heath Ledgery uh, mouth makeup, if you will. This is kind of like mm-hmm. smeared rather than very, very pristine like uh, Jack Nicholson's was. His hair is grown out. I think that's about how long your hair is right now, isn't it, Mike? <laughs> it's not yeah, a little it's getting shorter. pretty close. And uh, he's wearing, it looks, is it a prison suit, a butcher's outfit, something? I, I can't tell, so... Uh, yeah, it seems like uh, the, probably the ample name to give this Joker would probably be what the Nightmare Joker. This is yeah, because this... you know to to not bury the lead, but you know there was a trailer for the Justice League Snyder Cut yeah. HBO Max, whatever the hell you want to call it, that came out today, and we see that this version of the Joker is in Batman's Nightmare or Dream yeah. or Premonition and, or whatever it's supposed to be, you know. And 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 I think Zack Snyder did say that this is the Nightmare version like when it came out anyway but i'm like Mm -hmm. i'm not listening to you until the trailer's out but um yeah so our trailer dropped and uh this trailer i believe correct me if i'm wrong is 90 percent new footage if not more um i i didn't recognize a lot of these shots that made the final cut of the movie um, yeah, it's it's hard to tell at this point in time. I was talking with a uh, with super fan of the show, uh, Jim, and uh, we were talking about you know what do you do? Do you rewatch the Justice League before this comes out so you can do a very uh, easy uh, compare and contrast from what you just saw? Or I was possibly thinking it has been so long since I've properly watched Justice League that maybe it is better to go in kind of with this fresh face so you can kind of maybe experience how Snyder originally wanted you to experience without the baggage of um, of um, 
uh, Joss Whedon's version mm-hmm. or whatever, how much of the version is his, you know? So I, that's what I'm thinking of doing. I think I'm going to go in without a rewatch and just try to experience how it was supposed to be intended and then yeah. maybe almost try to review the movie again and, and, and let's see how it goes. Uh, we'll have to find out. But to answer your question, I don't really know what exactly seemed new and what didn't because I... I'm trying hard to remember what honestly happened in that movie. There were some shots that seemed like I could judge where they came from, right? Like there's a shot where like Aquaman like uh, smashes down the trident and stops this wall of water. And I believe I remember that moment. That's like the same set piece where like that bat climbing robot was like trying to get out of that hole. Uh, I don't re- I don't remember exactly yeah. what was happening in that scene, but I think that's what that scene's from. So I can recognize the parts of the movie, but yeah, I couldn't tell you if that one well, specific shot was original or not. Well, you know? I, it, well, and I think the point of it is probably showing like again, this is Zack Snyder's Justice League. They wanted to put more in there, but I did notice, yeah, you know, we didn't get this when Superman dies. His scream sends out a wave of shockwave around the world, right? Uh, mm-hmm. That apparently crashes a building in Themyscira, uh, which is interesting. Was the nightmare? Here's where I was getting. Is the nightmare verse in Batman v Superman, or is that proper in Justice League? Oh God! I this, see. This is a whole other part. Like I just those movies just kind of meld in my head together, and I try yeah. to remember what happened. Where sometimes I forget that Cyborg wasn't in Batman and Superman, and I get yeah. them confused because. Well, Cyborg, because that last shot where we get to see the Joker reveal and it's the the nightmare, Cyborg is in the background with yeah. Batman. And I was trying to remember, wait, it, was Cyborg in that nightmare yeah, in the Justice it, League? I don't remember. <laughs> it was not. So the nightmare, I just, I just actually, I just looked it up. The, the, the nightmare version was a Batman v Superman. Um, and uh, because that was the whole thing where the Flash came back and said, save Lois or whatever. Um which I which we tied to the Mar thing. So yeah, Cyborg wasn't there. Obviously, Jared Leto's Joker wasn't there. Who's giving us the end of the, the the last line of this trailer? Who's probably going to be in this movie? What all of that line? Maybe not a little yeah, more. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and then you know there is the dark side, and uh, like again, he's leaned into this dark side a little heavily. And like the forces of apocalypse, we even see him walking with uh, characters Dasad, and then what I noticed most was Granny Goodness on his left hand side. And uh, mm-hmm. Granny Goodness is one of the new gods, right? Who is supposed to be in that movie done by, um, oh, I can't think of her name, Ava DuVernay. Uh, mm-hmm. like, so, so she's supposed to be part of this. So I, I don't know how much of Dark Side, how much of this apocalypse are we going to see? How much of this nightmare oh, okay. universe are, are we going <laughs> to get? I just got to talk about Dark Side for a second. So Dark Side, you know, he looks fine. This will be fun. I really don't think he's going to be in the movie that much, right? Because yeah. it's really Steppenwolf is the villain of the film. So I imagine we're going to see Dark Side in like flashbacks or, you know, maybe in an, in an extended uh, uh, battle scene, right? Uh, but he's not like a, a real character in the film. And uh, much like Rick and Morty has one of the worst fan bases on the planet that I can't stand, even though I really like Rick and Morty, I feel like this the Snyder universe is uh, is uh, going is going head to head with them because I swear I saw a bunch of people online trying to compare Thanos to dark side like the characters like one was just like yeah. thanos uh the guy and dark side the the guy she told you not to worry about and it's just like are you really trying to say that this one shot of dark side in this film is totally better than josh brolin's appearance as thanos for like two full films and uh-huh. it's just like it blows my mind like like i like you don't need to pit these two things together this isn't like the console wars like back when you were right. a teenager like when you were 12 and you couldn't afford both consoles so you had to make a fight you know it was just like really you're comparing these two characters like it just I, I could go to bat and I think I could easily uh, debate that just on what we've seen so far that Thanos is the better execution yeah. and even well, after this film I think it's safe to say that it is but you're comparing apples and oranges here right. Thanos is a main voice act character with a whole narrative written around him and Dark Side's going to be a cameo in this film that is not going anywhere after it's over so I, I'm not trying this this actually is not a hit on Snyder this is just a hit on on the insane yeah. fans that have has that have circled around this movie, and I'm only talking about the insane fans. I know there's there's very level headed fans that want to yeah. watch this movie as well. So I, it's just I don't just the online discourse got to me this week, so I just had to let it out. Well, I, I'm on the same I'm on the same page. Like I want to see this movie to see the differences, right? And and, and give it a shot. Uh, now, I mean. Will I compare it to Marvel? No, I can't. Um, this is what the, essentially the third movie of of Snyder's trilogy, if you will. So you know, comparing again, like you said, Thanos, who had a whole 
overarching story with Infinity Stones across every Marvel movie. This is more like our Loki, right? He was in a, a villain in one, uh, not even a villain on, but like, you know, he's just bringing the forces to Earth kind of thing. So I, I, I agree with you. The fans have taken this, their hype and their wants and wishes for this and elevated it to something, and we haven't seen it yet. And it's not fair to compare it because it's definitely not. It's a very unique scenario. Uh, so... Um, all I all I can tell you is that we live in a society, Mike, and, and that's <laughs> that's all that that matters. Uh, but also that Warner Brothers, Zack Snyder said Warner Brothers has no plans to move forward with a sequel to this movie. Uh, so I think this will be the last um, Justice League of this this iteration for a while. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I I what even though I don't necessarily need to see a sequel for this i think things could change depending on the analytics that they get when they put this on the hbo max server right you know how many new subscriptions does it drive like really how many streams does it have not just for success on the hbo max platform but like wow this actually if it was if it ends up pulling numbers that's like comparable to like a netflix's stranger things or something like that they would be idiots maybe not to talk about you know something that's adjacent to it but um yeah it makes sense that they wouldn't put uh, anything in the sand right now right yeah it hasn't aired yet well and then he also mentioned i i don't think i put this in this what he called it the um justice is white or justice is black and white edition justice is gray or something like that where he's literally yeah, i think debuting a pro- black and white version of this Oh gosh! Uh, I mean, that's uh, oh, that's so Snyder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very much so. Uh, so um, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how this goes. Hopefully, I mean, again, I, I want to watch it. I do. I really do. And uh, we can move on with it, move forward, and, and you see know, what these big question, Chris. Really, really big question. If he's making a black and white version, how the hell are you supposed to get hyped when that black suit for Superman comes in? Right? It's yeah. gonna look the same. I mean, obviously, like the tone and like you know the just the overall values of the suit will change. But like, will somebody go like, Oh wow, nice new black suit. And it's just like, it's all black. This is a black and white movie. What the hell are you talking about? Well, well, I want to see, I I mean now Mike, now I want the Snyder trilogy in black and white. Give me all three of them. Cause I'm going to have to see the colors. What would be really cool, right, is if you go black and white, make everything black and white except for his laser beam eyes. Uh That would be cool. That's like the only thing that's colored in the whole thing. Then at least there's like a novel reason that I can watch that. How about give every superhero a color that they get? Like Superman gets red or like... You know, Batman. Well, oh, he gets God. black. That, but, that's a little much. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no. Aquaman. He can have orange like his pants, right? Uh, no, uh, I'm, I'm kidding. But I, I mean, yeah. So I'm excited to see this. It comes out on March 18th, the Thursday before Falcon and Winter Soldier. Um, the, literally the day after my birthday. I've got a busy weekend planned for that, Mike. I think, I think we're gonna have a <laughs> yeah. very busy weekend. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Excited to see that. The Peacemaker show, the spinoff for um, James Gunn's um, Suicides, The Suicide Squad, uh, uh, the head of HBO Max says it will debut in January of 2022. So uh, they're filming it right now up in Canada. It sounds like they're going to be able to get it done and out. And then in that case, it makes me think it might be a sequel to the movie. But, you know, hell, it could be a prequel. We don't know. We don't know what it's, uh, Peacemaker's, uh, I guess, status is at the end of that film yet. So. Yeah, I mean, Suicide Squad, they're all expendable, right? But, I mean, if you got, like, John Cena, probably, like, one of the the top-listed names in your film, like, yeah, he might survive to the end of the film. Yeah. So, prequel or post or sequel. Whatever. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, January 2020. I like January stuff. I need stuff to watch in January. So, yeah, that'll, cool. That'll kick off the year pretty good. I think that's when what all the – that's literally the first month all the shared theater exclusives expire. So, mm-hmm. um, so I think that'll be a good – could like only watch on HBO Max. Keep keep your subscriptions, and then catch Titans season four afterwards or whatever it's on. <laughs> uh, bigger news this week. Uh, I've had a lot of people ask me about this one actually. Is the Mandalorian uh, Gina Carano who played <sighs> um, Cara Dune has been fired from the series? And uh, while wow. I think this is news today, I don't think this is news to them. I don't think this this I'm- happened recently. I mean, this is so. This is interesting. Usually, we kind of avoid kind of politics in general on the show, just because we want to focus on like the nerdy stuff. And the more yeah. you get into the the weeds, it becomes less fun. And we like for the show to be an escape from the madness. 
you know, no matter what you think or you believe. But I, I guess we're kind of forced to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, because she was a, she was a, a main character in the Mandalorian. You know, she was obviously one of the side characters, but she reoccurred just as much as any of the other ones. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, she. I'll put it this way. Uh, she was she had very specific political views here in America which she was getting away with right you know she was very vocal about how she felt about uh, certain elections and certain aspects of it and she still kept her job right you know I, I was I, really what I was doing I wasn't thinking big Disney executives in my head I was thinking of Dave Filoni yeah. who has like crafted this character in his tv show right and then he has to see these things that that his actor is saying on social media and basically he's just waiting for where is it to will it where it crosses the line where i don't feel comfortable anymore you know disney might end up making the decision but you know at what point does he not feel comfortable as a creator anymore And I would say she met the threshold, right? You know, when you start comparing, like, the Holocaust to being a certain political party in, like, the year 2020, 2021 – You've you've just jumped the shark. You've gone into the stratosphere. You, you're you're totally just off base, and I'm not surprised that she got fired. And I think she yeah. deserved it. I and I, I I think so as well. I don't think maybe Dave Filoni. I think maybe John Favreau, um, who mm-hmm. has. I mean, Dave Filoni is the creative mind behind this and, and did a great there. But Dave, John Favreau has a lot writing on this. You know, as his like this is also his baby, right? Like he he's probably mm-hmm. funded a lot of it and put people in the right places. So, um. And then just Disney as a whole probably did like it. And she's been in trouble for on and off for about a year. Uh, I, I honestly thought she'd be fired for the second season for some stuff she did earlier last year, but they probably already filmed it and, and put it out there. Now, I also had heard that she had uh, been uh, kind of – they've been making wanting to do her own show for her character, right? Uh, mm-hmm. and, and, and have a spinoff that they were going to announce last fall, but she – uh, was also making some mistakes last fall online on Twitter, and they removed it from that as well. Moved her show from the the, I guess the network lineup as well. So, um, yeah, it, it's just it's it's sad that that people are are like that, and we still have to kind of deal with that. But you know, yeah. um, I, I, I mean, think, if we have, to- yeah. I was just going to say, if we have to specifically talk about the future of the Mandalorian, I think it's totally fine, right? I mean, yeah. the luxury of kind of these characters just being uh, side characters that, that Mando just kind of reaches out to when he needs them. I mean, he could easily just not have to reach out to this person anymore, right? You know, this this character could easily just move on and we never see them again. And I don't think a lot of people would just be like, oh, where did Cara Dune go? I mean, well, I guess she's just on the planet being a sheriff and, you know, Mando has moved on to a totally different aspect of his life because... Because, I mean, he, he Grogu is now uh, gone. You know, he could possibly be coming back in the future. But he's yeah. he's taking on a new chapter that's probably going to revolve a lot around Mandalore. So, you know, I no one's going to be surprised. So I don't know if Gina Carraro thought she had some sort of job stability and they thought, oh, they could never get rid of my character. And from a viewer's point of view, I would say, actually, you're pretty easy to get rid of. You know, you're not like a Jedi. You're not a Force user. Yeah. You're not exactly like a, a super cool bounty yeah. hunter with, like, very she- iconic armor. You're a brand new character character so well i'm pretty sure she didn't show up till halfway through season two anyway mm-hmm. um so yeah I, I think i think uh i don't think they'll replace her but i think you know they'll they'll have to fill that void with a new character they have to create which you know or bring yeah, bring in I, over from the clone wars yeah i saw some people doing some of their own fan recasting and it's just like i don't think you need to recast this character i mean even though there were some fun moments in mandalorian season one and season two with that character I'm not wholly attached to her. Mm. Like everyone's just attached to Grogu and Mando. And then you get like awesome Ahsoka every once in a while. And Boba Mm. Fett's back. I mean, honestly, uh, so many other characters just overshadow. I'm not saying the character couldn't have been built out to be something else, but it wasn't to that point to where you couldn't cut the shoot and be like, all right, I'll see you later. So, uh, I guess we'll we'll have to find a new big uh, uh what do what do they say in like MMOs and Dungeons and Dragons? We got to find a new big heavy, a new big tank, yeah, yeah, tank to I fill think, that role. Yeah. I mean, it, you're in, you're playing in a galaxy here. Yeah. It's not going to be hard to find another big character to, to hold a big machine gun, right? Yeah, and and also a reminder, she was in Deadpool, uh, the first one as the oh yeah, that's right. Uh, people forget that. I'm like, oh yeah, she really got her she cut her teeth in Deadpool first, and then and then came over. Mm-hmm. So. Um, yeah, uh, really, really sad that she had to to be that way. But uh, you know, in 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 the ever growing Star Wars universe, there's always a new character to take that place. I say mm-hmm. bring the sheriff from Episode One. I can't think of the actor's name off the top of my head. Timothy Oliphant. Bring oh, I bring love, him on board. 
I love Timothy Oliphant. That's another hairdo that I want to get yeah. on. When we were talking about Bucky's hair, I was like, yeah. I talked about another hairdo within yeah. the last couple months. What was that? So that's what I'm going to do when I can yeah. finally go back to the hairdresser. I'm going to show them Timothy Oliphant from Mando. I'm going to show them uh, Bucky from Falcon and the Winter Soldier and be like, all right, these these are my mood boards right yeah. now. Put it on my head. There you go. That'll do it. Uh, in a, a whirlwind of news here, uh, Craven the Hunter. <laughs> Uh, over at God, Sony. Chris, I forgot about this. Yeah. Honestly, until we scrolled down to this Google Doc and I saw this, I was like, oh, yeah, that did happen yeah, this week. Yeah, Keanu Reeves was reportedly offered the role of Craven the Hunter in the Sony film. And then literally uh, within a day, someone was, the reports where he has reportedly turned it down possibly months ago. So um, <laughs> who knows when this news was. But like they were saying that the film for Craven the Hunter is a mashup of the movies Man on Fire and Logan, if you will. Wow. So I'm uh, I'm glad I got that second bit of the news because the last time I touched this story, it was just with like, oh, could Keanu be Craven? And then uh, I voiced my opinion and then I forgot about it. But yeah. in my head, I don't want Keanu wasted on a character like Craven. Right. I'm not saying he's a, not a he's not a cool character in the Spider-Man universe. But if you have somebody of the level of Keanu Reeves, first of all, don't make him like just, you know, uh, maybe I would I would classify him as like a secondary Spider-Man villain. Maybe primary, depending on how you like to make your Sinister Six makeup, but, you know, it's like Doc Ock and Mysterio and, like, Goblin. You know, those are, like, those are the main baddies, right? So Craven usually is second fiddle to that. So don't put Keanu in that role. Yeah. And also, like, I don't... I can't picture it, right? Keanu is, like, a very laid-back, you know, silent or just kind of crazy over-the-wall wacky character. And I suppose you could maybe change the direction of maybe of how I have Craven set in my mind, but I just couldn't quite picture it. And thirdly, don't waste him on a Sony property, right? You know, I, I do realize that he could appear in a mainline MCU film as Craven, even if Sony does cast him, but like, no, Marvel, you swoop in. Don't let Keanu get wasted on this. Just give Keanu $5 million to just take down the role. Don't even offer him an alternative role, right? Just, yeah. no, we'll save you for something in the future, you know? So but, that's my mind of it. So I'm happy to see the second bullet point of that he turned well, it down. Well, the only person taking on Sony movie roles at this point was uh, Tom Hardy, who, who took a, a pretty good stab at Venom. I'll give him that. And then, and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunity with the second one, but also Jared Leto for Morbius. Uh, and, you know, the next thing we see him in is in what? Uh, what is it? Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Justice League uh, in the Nightmare <laughs> version. So I, I don't think even taking those movies, uh, you know, to me are the, the, the big serious actors who, you know, who, who are thinking about their future. I think Keanu Reeves could take on, take anything he wanted to. And, um, you know, if this was months ago, I assume it was months ago. It sounds like this Craven is an older Craven, and you know, why would you, why would you stick yourself with an older Craven who's like on his last hunt? You know, like why put yourself in a thing where you're gonna have an older guy like in that Logan scenario? You know, forties, fifties, you know, worn down, not really wanting to do anything. What What's the point of that? Um, when you could, you know, maybe maybe take a more younger, energetic person to do it mm -hmm. uh, and, and and have a longer lifespan for this character other than a one-off movie and possibly a sinister six but like you got uh, it's just it's rough it's rough up there for those people but we'll see if this movie even comes to pass mike hopefully disney just buys sony right up and we don't have to do <laughs> the last of us the movie it is filming uh it's coming up they're gonna do it and they found two huge stars in this um, movie. We're actually going to be talking about some video game movies. And, and I think the biggest one is Pedro Pascal as um, the lead in Joel. Mm -hmm. And then um, actress Bella Ramsey uh, from Game of Thrones is Ellie. Now, Bella Ramsey, you may not know offhand, but she was the um, the young girl who led the – which house was it? Uh, she always had that mean it look was on her face. Yeah, it was uh one of the one of the northern uh one yeah. of the northern tribes or whatever yeah, it you want to call it. But she, she was the little sassy one. She was yeah. a little sassy girl. Yeah, she was like it looked like she was like maybe ten or so in that role. And um, yeah. I think she's also in his Dark Materials as well. I don't know in what capacity. I believe so. But as well. also. Yeah. Also, I think it was a slip of the tongue at, at, at the top of the segment, but it, this is a, a TV series, yeah. not a movie. But I think that was just a Freudian yeah, yeah. slip inside your brain. Yeah, yeah. But sure. so this was this was interesting news because the Bella Ramsey Ellie casting dropped first, 
And uh, I have a friend that we uh, we are really big fans of the the Last of Us franchise. So you know we were speculating what maybe the our fan castings would be. You know months and weeks ago. And so when this news dropped, I texted to him right away and we're like, oh, wow, this is actually really, really good. You know, they went pretty young with the character, which means that they see a long road out in front of them. Right. That this that this franchise, you know, could be multiple, multiple seasons. And that's what every streamer wants. Right. They want something with longevity that they can get a lot of viewers out of. So it's cool to see that they're kind of putting their stake in the sand that like, oh, yeah, we're starting off, you know, OG really early in Last of Us Part One when uh, Ellie is just a child. Right. Yeah. Um, so that was pretty cool casting. Uh, Pedro Pascal, I, I had a we had a slightly different tone when we saw that casting of just like this is huge, really big star power. It goes to show you that HBO slash HBO Max. I don't know technically what banner this is under anymore. Uh, it was really really uh, vibing on this show. I mean to get the Mandalorian on your show and you're basically have two head to head competing streaming services like that's that's a it's a big deal. It's like under, it's like an understatement to say that's a big deal. I mean, theoretically, the two services, their single biggest streaming series could star the same actor, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, Pedro is going to be printing, printing money, so I'm very, very happy for him. And he has a similar look to him, right? You know, he has a he has he has a little bit of a gruff look, and he could also age with the show as well, uh, because from part one and part two, I want to say there's at least like maybe eight years between part one and part two. I don't know the exact Five years. Uh, numbers. So there's a, there's definitely a journey to be, mm. to be shown here, but I don't know when I kind of imagine Joel and I hear his voice, I imagine somebody like very, very gruff, somebody that's like very down in the dirt, you know, somebody willing to do anything that it takes to get the mission done or keep his surrogate daughter alive. And I don't know, Pedro Pascal seems to have a little bit more of a, a flourish to him, right? He seems to have a little bit more of a, um, uh, you know, it's weird to say because all of the things I just used to describe Joel, you could use those same words to describe the Mandalorian, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't know. Pedro Pascual has a, a little bit more of a suaveness to him, kind of when I look at him, right? And you can see a lot of that suaveness in uh, Wonder Woman 1984. So, yeah, it's not the perfect casting, but I'm okay. What I'm trying to say is I'm okay with it, and this is not a deal breaker for me in any way. As someone who's not played the games, and I don't know if you're, it's five years between the games. Um, okay. Uh, but as someone who's not played the games, I, I imagine Pedro Pascal from the Mandalorian episode with Bill Burr when he takes the helmet off with the mm -hmm. things. That looks like Joel, like when he's like run down and sweaty and like scared kind of thing. Like, mm -hmm. not the, I don't think of the Kingsman or the Wonder Woman. Uh, you know, sophisticated ladies' man uh, mm -hmm. thing, but both of these actors are were in Game of Thrones, right? Like, like literally. Yeah, that is a, that's a whole other thing. Yeah, you forget about Pedro Cras Pascal's earlier career yeah. when he was in the biggest yeah. TV show. <laughs> yeah, but I also think I mean I'm going to tell you as as someone who does, has a played these games, I imagine literally the first season setting this world and setting this collapse of the world rather than jumping right into the collapse of the world. Um, yeah, maybe because like you, know, maybe he is a, 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 a better because if I correct me if I'm wrong, Joel is a smuggler in this universe. Yeah, once kind of the world collapses and everything, I believe he was just a normal average Joe at the start of the the video game. But yeah, when I imagine Joel, I imagine he is the actor that they cast in like a Ford commercial when they're trying to sell you a truck, right? You know, he's got the blue jeans on, he's got the flannel, you know, he's mm -hmm. throwing two by fours in the back of his truck and heading yeah. to the work site. Uh, Pedro Pascal seems more like the guy that's going to sell you like a really nice, like high end liquor like so like a really nice vodka right and he like cleans up really nicely in a suit so those are just two conflicting ideas that are in my mind yeah. but um i'm but, totally down with it yeah. I'm, I'm excited i'm very excited yeah. for this and this is hbo proper not hbo max um okay so that'll be i mean i assume it'll be on both right they do that with all the other shows i mean yeah i don't even i don't even think there's a distinction anymore yeah. but since this since the the start of this show the production of it was before HBO Max launched, I'm sure that there's some like, you know, uh, where the money came from. Involved. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. I, so this is coming. Um, that's the start of the casting. I uh, like you said, you know, I could see them doing that. I, I'd like to see them, you know, even if they wanted to do a time jump uh, somewhere down the road, if they wanted to, or they could literally yeah, fill I'm... in the five years in between, they could do whatever they want with this show and not have to follow the games, but like, you know, really build the world out because that's, 
you know, one thing I'd, I'd be interested in seeing for this. Yeah. I mean, it's not exactly an original storytelling mechanic, but I always liked what they did in Arrow, uh, where they would do the modern story and then they would cut back and maybe about a third to a quarter of every episode was them flashing back to the past. So, you know, I would, I would be cool with something like that too. Um, there's lots of, there's lots of fun ways that you could tell mm. this type of story. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of good opportunities for video game movies right now. Oh, wait, we're going to talk about another one. Borderlands, the movie adaptation of this, has added some big names here. Uh, mm-hmm. Jamie Lee Curtis was uh, one that was added this week. Kevin Hart, I believe, was one of the first ones. Kate Blanchett as another one as a siren, I believe, Lilith. And then lastly, on Friday, Jack Black as the um, Claptrap character, the little talking sassy robot, uh, which is perfect for him. Uh, I think this is great. And then, I didn't know this, this is directed by Eli Roth of... You know, <laughs> mid two thousands horror movie fame. So yeah, I don't, I don't know if that's a, if that's a good sign. It's a or good, not. it's a good sign based on how gory that game is and how silly it is. I think, I think yeah. it's perfect. Yeah, so from my point of view, we can flip the script here. I've never played any of the Borderlands games. I'm familiar with the aesthetic. I've seen lots of very, very cool and intricate cosplays where people kind of paint themselves to kind of look like those 2D cel-shaded characters. So I know we're not in like a hyper-realistic type of scenario here. Uh, I've heard the looting in the game is addictive. (laughs) Apparently that's a really fun part of the the game, but I have no idea what the story is. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how attached I should be to these characters or this casting, but uh, yeah, when you see somebody like Kevin Hart and Jack Black uh, included with this uh, film, I mean, those are, I mean, that's uh, Jumanji. Those are two big, huge uh, uh, Jumanji actors that'll bring in some big bucks. Yeah. So um, these, so for people who know, Jamie Lee Curtis is signing on to play Tannis. Jack Black is Claptrap. Kevin Hart is Roland, and um, Kate Blanchett is Lilith. So these are all characters who are there's three games and they deal with vault hunters they're searching for a vault and these characters are in the first are introduced in the first game and they carry throughout like they all like the characters like two is a different set of vault hunters with abilities but like the other ones show up because you're all hunting these vaults and you open these vaults find a big creature and then get all the loot from it like you said it's it's, it's a looter shooter but it's very very zany in how it's presented like it's like a a world I believe called Pandora and it's like desert and there's marauders and there's crazy cults. Uh, it's very much uh, a really, I, I really enjoy the games. I've loved them for since the first one came out. I recently beat the third one when I got my new Xbox uh, because mm-hmm. the load time wasn't forever. But um, I, 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 I'm excited about this. I don't care if they follow the games because the game is, they get a little wild. There's a lot of quests. Uh, you're, you're familiar with games that give out quests. Like it's nobody's business, right? Where you have a, mm-hmm. I like a, a little digital reader and it shows you everything you've done this main quest or side quest and there's like a hundred of them you're like oh i feel a little overwhelmed uh so i don't need the questing but i'd be interested to see how they deal with the um the vault hunters and their abilities because they all have skill trees in the game so like roland's a shooter uh lilith is a siren which is essentially like um imagine like a kind of like a what am i looking for here um jean gray kind of character she has like psychic abilities and stuff like that uh so uh I'm excited to see this. I'm excited to see the humor in it. Um, and it is expected to be rated R as well uh, with all the the violence from the game. So hopefully they, they can do something good with this. As long as they can nail the aesthetic, Mike, like I, like you said, I think that's the, the thing. And in terms of story, it can loosely be based on the game. I'm not too... I'm not too worried yeah, about that. I'm actually, I'm on the PlayStation website. I'm just like, I bet there's a bundle. Like these games have been out for a while. Yeah. I could probably do exactly what I did with the Uncharted games. And just like for probably like 30 bucks, I can get like all of the Borderlands games. And I can just like probably there, play them all here and the really hands- get into the story. The Handsome Collection was the first one. I believe that includes uh, one, two, and then the pre-sequel, uh, which was uh, the technically like two and a half. Um, no. so it's like the prequel to the two, which was the sequel. So they, they kind of made fun of that a little bit. Um, the third one's more recent. I think it's in the past two years and they're releasing the Borderlands three director's cut in March. Uh, so, um, there's, there's a lot of references in this game, a lot of humor to be had, uh, at the sake of video games and the characters, which is, which is really fun. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm looking forward to this, but I don't need a, I don't need a trilogy of these movies. I could take one to be, be okay with it. And lastly, in the video game news, the nostalgia for the nostalgia laden people, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 has a release date, April 8th, 2022. And this little teaser here plays the Sega sound, Mike. 
with the sonic <laughs> Sega. And, like with the sonic sound uh the from the games and i'm, I'm gonna listen to it while, while i load it up here because i'm like i'm just very excited about this like it's not like the best thing in the world like you know again sonic one's really it's good but it's not great but like the nostalgia of seeing this and hearing this was on point Oh yeah, um, I'm I'm kind of been listening to it on repeat while you've been uh, talking, but man, that's yeah, that's a very oh, I love that sound. That's yeah, great. and then you see uh, the two has tails, uh, two tails for, mm-hmm. for for tails being in it, and I believe Knuckles as well. We've talked we've talked about before, so uh, yeah, that's great. Hopefully they can get to filming this and get it up and going, and they don't have to redesign Sonic in the middle of this again. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess they'll uh, the productions will hopefully be less sweaty. Yeah. you know because they don't have to redo the character yeah yeah have you have you had a chance to watch sonic yet at all no i need to it's uh just one of those films that you know i bet i could get my wife to watch that one mm. probably a lot easier than willie's wonderland right yeah it'd be like <laughs> hey you know how bad that was it's only uphill from here uh so <laughs> yeah yeah so I, i'd recommend people get a chance to watch that uh, in terms of video game movies and get excited for this i want to see uh, again i know they're not filming anything on it right now hopefully but like i want to see the design of knuckles and see what it is maybe he's the villain is is uh, how how's um Robotnik tie into this one a little bit? So, uh, very 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 excited to get that back. Now it's for your favorite time of the episode, folks. It's where we talk WandaVision, uh, because yeah. every week we get a new episode, and instead of ruining all the spoilers at the front, waiting for you to watch it, we're gonna put them at the end of the episodes. And we'll, yeah, we'll- so I guess whenever there's like a premium comic book TV show that's airing, whether it's on Disney Plus or HBO Max, uh, if you want to tune in, we'll we'll talk about it at the end of every episode. Because we were just talking about it before we started recording. We were like, well, based on the schedules that Disney Plus has for all of these shows, I think the majority of the 50 plus episodes that we make a year are going to have a mcu tv show attached to one of them so we we might as well just build in like you know we got like mike's anime corner we got chris reviewing snacks and food you know at the top of the show the end of the show now we're gonna officially cap with the streaming show reviews yes and um what's 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 great about these shows is literally like normally we wouldn't do this for a tv show right like we wait till the end of it like uh, what was it? The boys are like, you know, we wait and just do the whole series. But with Marvel, like they're literally giving us new bits of information. You know, our theories get to run wild. Our minds get to imagine these different scapes of, of what could be and what will be in these shows. And I, you know, with Wanda, there's nine episodes. Uh, Falcon and Soldier has six, um, one hours. And I imagine they're always going to end with something big at the end of those episodes to keep us coming back for more. So. Oh gosh. Did you, have you seen the meme that's starting to float around of the screenshot of the please stand by? Cause that's when you officially know the episode's yeah. over and you're like, no, I want to watch well, more. Well, that's what I told you <laughs> earlier. Uh, again, spoilers for this week's episode. When vision was walking into the field with all the black you know, behind him, I was like, this is where the episode ends, isn't it? Like he's going to walk into the field and it's going to say, please stand by. I'm like, you son of a bitch, but it didn't. It kept going. Um, these, these half hour episodes are, are great, but Kevin Feige did say the final three episodes that are kind of are about an hour long, making this total about a six hour long show, which uh, w- lines up with literally all the other MCU plans. Yeah. For TV shows. That's great. So you know that the show is really starting to crank it up narratively because I don't know if that was originally planned, but you can tell when they were starting to break the season in the writer's room and they were writing down the stories and the ideas. They were just like, wow, we have a lot of uh-huh. stuff that we have to cram in these last three episodes. There's no way that we can keep them into a half an hour. And then I, I wonder if they're a little trepidatious, like, ooh, we're going to have to call Feige. Do you yeah. think he, they'll approve, like, an hour-long episode? And he was just like, yeah, sure. He's like, you got I mean, six you hours. Me? Use, what, use them how you want to. I don't care. <laughs> the the Bobs won't literally won't stop throwing money at me. No. Every time they talk with me, they give me a $20 bill, no. like, every two seconds. It's just, I got plenty of money to throw at you. Yeah, you can make these an hour long. Yeah. And, and speaking of money, the effects on the show are movie quality effects in this mm-hmm. specifically there are shots with the vision breaking down as he tries to leave the 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 field right and did you mm-hmm. like the how he was like essentially disintegrating in front of us like snap like the snap happened um was very very good quality effects for you know even uh, any tv show but even even more so knowing it's marvel property and they're putting the love of that into it the whole time yeah this episode was very awesome but 
uh, frustrating in a good way because last week when we talked about the last week's episode, me and you had it out because we had all of these questions of, oh, what's going on with Evan Peters? You know, uh, what uh, what is uh, Visions like existence? And we haven't we have none of these questions answered, yeah. but we have a maybe slightly more insight to what's going on. But I think the highlight of this episode for me was I love Evan Peters' performance mm-hmm. uh, as Quicksilver or Pietro or I don't yeah. know exactly what you want to call him, but it's just it's just fun him just kind of being the uh, the kooky crazy uncle and I love the the Malcolm in the middle uh, motif yeah. for this you can you, we're definitely starting to modernize the show a little bit more and with modern television you get one of the greatest comedic inventions on television in history which is the cutaway so we're finally starting to get those I, I never thought my brain needed a cutaway to uh, Wanda and Pietro as kids trick-or-treating in Sokovia and when she gave them the fish I was like this is hilarious did, did I send it to you that they're dressed up as as Black Widow and Nick Fury as kids. Oh, yeah, you sent that my way. Yeah. yeah. So I, I was like, oh, that's a fun little reference here without having to do a whole lot of work, mm-hmm. right? Like, I know they're not, a, like, we know they're not, but it's a cutaway, right? It's a joke. It's supposed to be that way yeah um yeah and i and i love how the the kids are kind of taking the uh narrative focus too where they're breaking uh, the fourth wall and talking yeah. it, uh, to the audience and they're and getting that. their powers we have speed and wiccan of course one of them has oh, yeah. wanda's powers one has what, quicksilver's powers what are you what a unique way. So this is one thing I always look at in superheroes TV shows, right? Is how do you take something that's grounded in reality and then give people superpowers, right? Because you can't just say somebody has superpowers. You can't just drop people in a vat of like nuclear waste anymore and give them powers. There's you got to come up with new and interesting ways or we'll talk about in a second, you got to like mutate people mm-hmm. uh, to give them powers. You know, famously, that's the reason why Stanley invented mutant. So he didn't have to come up with these crazy cockamamie schemes anymore to give people powers. But when you're in this weird, like, mind trip, magical web of Wanda's magic, like, how do you have people give powers? Well, you're in a trope of television. They just get them, and we're totally okay with them manifesting powers because we're in this weird world to begin with, and no one can make sense of it. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it's super cool to see them uh, get powers. You know, uh, we got the speedster first, and then later on we get uh, some magical powers with the other kid. I can't get the kids' names Uh, right in my head. Billy and Tommy. um... I believe uh, to- uh, Billy is the speedster and Tommy is the uh, the magic user. I probably got this backwards, it, it, but yeah. So and and then on top of that, I love all of the homages to the classic mm-hmm. costumes. Yeah, uh, the I, comic we book costumes ob- is on point. Yeah. Quicksilver's hair l- l- spiked up a little bit on the sides. Yeah, yeah. I think we gotta you know give credit to maybe Luke Cage. I would give credit to Luke Cage for for giving us the most uh, craziest golden age comic book uh, uh, kind of snippet you know we, you know Captain America is kind of in his classic costume you know uh, back in the 19 like 40s when in, in yeah. the first Avenger film but like Luke Cage you really had to go way out of your way to possibly show him in his like chain belt and like cut off shirt and they managed to work that in that I believe it was the first yeah, season yeah, but the, it was with it was the, the tiara season. whenever they were giving him his powers or yeah yeah, yeah. So I will, I will give mad props to the the Luke Cage team for manifesting that costume. But these in here are great. I was wondering, uh, I don't know if that Sokovian fortune teller is truly the origin no. for her costume in the comics, no. but it played it played off very very yeah. well. Uh, I don't know if Vision as a Mexican wrestler was the best explanation for it, but I didn't really care because he just looked yeah. silly and I liked it. Well, if, I mean that, that that their interaction with that felt like Malcolm in the Middle, right? Like the the dad the mom. Mm-hmm. It felt like that with the kids as well. Um, I, I got to ask you, because this has been sitting in my mind, this is the weirdest commercial we've had by far. Uh, oh, yeah. With, I was trying to <sighs> figure out what it's connected so to. The, what, was there a brand or something? No, I couldn't remember. It, yeah, it was like Magic Yo or Yo Magic. Was the, was it, it was yeah. Yo Magic, and it's the um, – it's a yogurt that the shark comes up and gives this kid on an island, but the kid can't open it, so he dies of starvation on the island. And I'm yeah. like, what the f- is going on with this? Like, this is not normal. That- that was strange because all of the commercial breaks we've seen so far have been very realistic to the time era, right? Oh. And they could theoretically be actual commercials, you know, replace the kind of uh, Easter egg branding to something like GE or like GM or whatever. And like, oh, yeah, this this all makes a uh, total sense. Yeah. But this is the first one where you couldn't actually imagine it as a real commercial. It does fit that kind of late 90s, early 2000s, like extreme juice. Yeah, there's pepperonis and everything now. Everything's flavor-based. Blasted, right? You know, it fit that vibe, but 
the commercials back then never had the character just die right. and because that you know this i'm getting way too into this but that would never theoretically sell your drink yeah. right or juice i don't even remember what the product Yo- it's was, Yo- it was but yogurt the sh- yeah it was, it was like yogurt yeah it was like yogurt. but the shark was on point so is this kind of our hint now that everything is really starting to fall apart that even wanda's commercials aren't really making sense anymore and, and like you know literally this so character's dying of starvation it could be the other thing is i noticed that the shark uses the phrase little dude and pietro does that other way does that later with the kids saying little dudes mm-hmm. um and then just just to talk about him he is the uh, one of the other other people who knows about wanda's uh, vision being dead stuff post his death right mm-hmm. and, and he gets blasted for that later uh so like is he some outside source trying to get information is he is he you know um created by some outside power is she really not she didn't seem like she was controlling him because she was trying to bait him with that kid like hey what's that kid who had like the the hand condition kind of thing he's like yeah you're, trying to catch like, me. you're testing me yeah yeah I, it, it's seeming to me that like we at, at, as of right now we do not know the origin right. of pietro the human being that's standing in front of us right? right we don't know where he came from did he come from the other side of town did he come from uh some other part in new jersey is from is he from literally another dimension did he manifest out of nowhere we don't know but it seems to me that right now he is just a combination of wanda's consciousness right because he seems to know everything that wanda knows and it almost yeah. seems like since she's trying to work out what exactly happened and how she got there like it's almost like she's talking with herself but it just happens to be pietro so there could very well be somebody under there but i think right now it's just too much wanda controlling everything for us to know what's happening i don't think so because he asked her how did the kids get here it's like well, he, I think that's I, I think that's because Wanda truly doesn't know herself well, either. I think she's like she's like I don't know how I did any of this. Yeah. So like uh, I should should start questioning yeah, it. Like I, I should start asking myself, and that just forms in another I, person. I, I think he I th- he he knows, and then um, Agnes seemed a little sketchy as well. In this, those are the two I'm keeping my eyes on because they're they're not acting like the rest of the town. Uh, are right like the rest of the town seem to be kind of like wanda what do you want what do you like the one guy was like what do you want us to do what can we do for you and Mm -hmm. like he seemed a little more free form agnes seemed like she was trying to set up the vision to do something uh, on the road yeah so yeah it it's it seems like we have three categories of people excluding wanda that are in this bubble yeah we have normal people normal planet earthlings that have been caught up in this magic or and are being puppeted by wanda to fulfill her desires of being in this perfect bubble we have the secondary category of vision of we don't really know what the hell is going on there right is he truly an empty husk like is he literally just like you know a pile of parts that's being puppeted and she's projecting a personality into him but there seems to be some sort of vision in there that's fighting back so we don't really know exactly what's happening there and then we have pietro some something we have no questions well, to either so that's how i'm organizing I, in my man i we have put, three categories of people i would put those two together because they're doing like they seem to have free will but they also don't seem to have free will i think yeah i think but agnes I don't know is if the pietro I, I don't know if Pietro has free will. Obviously, we could see it happen, but I've yet to see any part of Pietro like fight back. Right? He seems to be well, very loose. He like he'll he's willing to say like, oh yeah, like you said, like oh yeah, you your husband can't die twice, right? Yeah. So he has like no filter. Right. Well, I, I don't think he has a filter. But I mean, the vision has no filter. He's like he's like we've never talked. Like he's like you never talked about this. We've never had an argument before. I I will put those two kind of in the same thing. Like they may not be in the same mindset but they're together but agnes is in the opening of every show um i, I don't know if you, you noticed that she was in this one as well like when he was running around with the camera kind of thing mm-hmm. so like why is agnes the focus of every episode or in every episode thing like what is her secret she's holding uh here for us because i think i think yeah, she's I got don't something. Know. I- I could see that going either way, honestly. Yeah. I could see you being totally right, and she's got some maybe ulterior motive, or she's special in some way. But I think, you know, just in a TV landscape, you need uh, characters with second billing, you mm-hmm. know, the neighbor that you're going to see a lot more than the postman. Yeah. So I, I think she's just more of a featured character, and that's just why we see I, her more. I'm, I'm leaning into she's a secret antagonist, because I think she killed their dog last episode. I think she killed it to get the kids to age themselves up. Mm-hmm. Maybe she needs adult, the adult children for something. 
I don't know. Maybe. Um, but we left the, we left the yeah. story with the hex growing. Yes. It's uh, we got to see it take over the uh, the sword headquarters and turn yeah. it into a carnival. So I'm very much expecting a carnival set piece yeah. in the next episode. Well, uh, I, I'm curious. Are they going to totally modernize the show next time? Because you know, if Malcolm in the Middle is like 90s. early 2000s, like late 90s, yeah. um, you know, are we going to move into like modern, or is there like you know, you could theoretically maybe do something like. I think we saw maybe Modern Family possibly yes, as an another, idea that they might do. Another breakaway where they talk to the camera with the Modern Family. Yeah, and, and then I, I guess technically if you go super meta, the last possible TV format would just be them being a normal TV show because streaming is normal. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know. Uh, maybe some Stranger Things synth music yeah. uh, will will pop up in the, in the last episode. Well, yeah, there's, there's no telling what the what the 20, I guess, 10s would be. I don't know if any trope really came out of those. Um but the, the hex grant the, before the hex grew, Darcy told Monica, "You cannot go back in there. Your your DNA has been rewritten twice. Go once going yes. in, once coming out." Chris, this this blew my mind. I don't. You have to tell me. Be honest. Is this an original idea that you had, or did you see people talking this, about it online? Because it totally blew right past my head, and I feel a little embarrassed this, that I didn't even think about it. I will. This was original to me. I, I was talking it out loud as it was happening. In, in bed mm. on, I got up at 7 a.m. on Friday to watch this in bed uh, with my <laughs> wife. So I was talking it out loud because I'm like, this, there's, there's no way. Because Monica Rainbow oh. gets powers, right? Like, she's a character photon or a spectrum in the books, whatever one you go to. But, like, if she goes back in, her power is going to be written. Her DNA is going to be mutated. Guess what? She's going to get abilities, right? Like, that's how she mm. ties into Captain Marvel. Well, if this hex is growing, this means everyone will have had to go through it once, if not twice. When they when mm. it uh, I guess contracts at the end of this, so what if she accidentally not necessarily encompasses the Earth with this, but like she gets to the point where she just explodes it and the residual energy goes all over the world, causing mutations in people, literally lending to mutant creation on accident because of this energy going around. Yeah, the world. I mean I have like so many thoughts on this because you blew my mind when I when you said that because I was like it makes total sense they put it right out there right in front of us they say your cells are mutating i think they did they use the word mutating or did they use the word changing I, i'm I not 100 percent sure yeah. but like they said like your dna has been altered you can't go back in there at first i just took it as like oh the writer of the episode just needs a just needs a way to tell monica to not go back in there or if you're gonna go back in there there needs to be stakes that your life's in danger if you go back in so i thought that was just kind of the they were just setting up the the you know the, the stakes of the decision. But yeah, if you're start, talking about like mutating DNA, it's just like, okay, that's a big deal. And if you if you think about the the comparisons to this season that everybody's making to the House of M, right? Mm-hmm. You know, Wanda making her own reality, right? The, the biggest consequences of that very iconic storyline of the House of M is at the very end when she says no more mutants and she gets rid of, uh, I think, almost all the mutants. Yeah, I don't, well, I don't yeah, like the powers majority of them. Yeah, like there's I know that there's like a sect that 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 stays behind. But so if Wanda in the comic books has just this strong entanglement with the mutants, it's kind of cool that, you know, in an alternate reality known as the MCU, that she could be possibly the the birth of all mutants. Right. You know, I think that would be kind of cool. And also further down the line, you know, if they're bringing in the X-Men that there's going to be a, a X-Men verse Avengers movie in some aspect, right? I mean, how do you yeah. not even broach that subject at least a little bit when you own all of these characters? So there could be some conflict there, right? Too. It's just like you created us. Uh, we're your problem. Now we're going to fight, you know, something like that. So that could be a really cool moment there that creates the mutants. And like, I'm, I'm already imagining like the visual effect, right? When she just can't keep up with all of these moving parts anymore. Yeah. She's like, her mind is exploding. Her eyes like turn super red and there's this, huge burst of red and you just see it sweep upon, uh, across the whole horizon yeah. you cut to like cities across the world that get hit with this red energy and then you know a couple movies down the line or maybe well, a couple streaming shows that down the line well, we start to see powers emerge let, let me let me pause right there what if they somehow tie in humans and x-men together with this creation so, I mean, this this is something that I feel like I've kind of broached the idea, you know, earlier uh, in, in the podcast uh, when we were kind of talking about the blip in Endgame back then of just like, really, if you're looking at it from an audience's point of view, 
you know, really, we just want to see people with superhuman abilities. We don't really care the origin, right? Mm -hmm. If they're a human or if they're mutants, they're just people that manifest powers at some point in time in their life. And now they're superheroes. So in a comic book world where you have all of these different stories that you can manage and it's something that's been going on for literally decades, you know, you invent the mutants first and then humans come along. In the MCU, do you really need two different things to explain people getting powers right, or is that well, just a little bit so too much to juggle? I, I think I think the difference is is how it's laid out. You know, X Men were treated like oh, you know, you're different than humans. It was like you know against uh, you know racism, misogyny. You know, the different classes and humans were more of like a political thing. Like imagine you know Black Panthers, like that kind of kingdom, but with people with powers. Like how do you handle like uh, uh, the everyone can have powers potentially how do you deal with that in in more spacey yeah. more sci-fi because they were fantastic for yeah. people so i think yeah but now in like today's day and age how do you separate right. like politics from like racism and well, you know discrimination and stuff like that so it just seems like a lot of the narrative story yeah. that you might tell between mutants if, and humans are starting to cross over if, a lot if you more. wanted powered people yes i merge them together if they want to go down the road of like how do you deal with the you know, a kingdom of, I mean, Eternals could set up in humans just as easily because they, they mm. deal like that, that whole branch of, of mutated people by aliens, is a whole different story uh, in and of itself. But yeah, I, I yeah. think there's an opportunity here. Like, you know, this could tie into, you know, Falcon and Winter Soldier definitely doesn't pick up probably three weeks after, um, you know, in game does like this. So they could be dealing with that fallout as well of, of powered yeah. people based yeah. on Wanda. Yeah. Yeah. Like you're saying, we could get our answer for mutants and in humans a lot sooner than this but i think the definitive moment is they will have to have their answer before miss marvel comes along right yeah. she is an iconic brand new character uh, rooted 100% in humans. She hasn't been around long enough for people to rewrite her origin, you know, and change her from a mutant to a human or whatever. She has one very specific origin in the comics canon now. And if they decide to make her an inhuman, and humans exist, the MCU now, you know, they're all all bored with inhumans. We're going to have to figure this out. Yeah. But if that show drops and we see like the first official reports of the first teaser trailer and they use the word mutant, or in her teaser trailer, we see a red wave of of energy come across her while she's in her room studying we know right i think that's a, a nail in the coffin for the inhumans you know well, at least for the next I, like 10 years well, right, I, th you know? I think i think that's a that's a very over generalization i think they can say oh mutated people are inhuman like they could literally combine the phrase rather than say mutants oh and inhumans. yeah yeah like, yeah no i i agree really like combine you them like, and be like oh these mutants these mutated people or these power people that's inhuman and be yeah, like oh we got I, humans I, now yeah i agree in the sense of like Eventually, when a Black Bolt is introduced, you yeah. know, his origin could be from Wanda's, like, yeah. you know, explode mutant power or whatever. So, uh, and anyway, I love that now we've set up, like, this little corner at the end of every episode where we can talk about this stuff. Because usually we leave all this really yeah. intricate stuff in the group chat. And then, like, oh, we talk about, like, oh, should we do, like, a final season review? And then we have to try to remember everything that happened yeah. over, like, the last nine weeks and all these little intricate things. Well, so I'm glad we kind of carved out this section of the podcast yeah. now where you just stay till into the end. And we're going to talk about every, like, little thing that just happened in that episode. Yeah, I think, I think the other thing, thing is to look forward to, uh, you it sounds like Monica's going to be meeting her aerospace engineer friend, which sounds like they're setting up another big reveal or cameo this week. So Yeah, exactly. Uh, I was I totally forgot I, about that. I'm leaning towards, I, I'm hoping, a, a character called Adam Brashear or Blue Marvel. Um, he He's also known to be with Captain Marvel, Black Panther, America Chavez, who's coming up in Doctor Strange. Uh, so, like, he, he has a history with, and, and, and Monica Rainbow. So he has a history with these characters. So we'll see if that comes to fruition, or if it's like, you know, maybe is it... Um, uh, Rody, Rody's an aerospace engineer, I believe. It's his title. Mm -hmm. So, you know, who's it going to be, Mike? And I don't know. We'll find out Friday. <sighs> yeah, isn't that great when like Wednesday or Thursday rolls around? You're just like, oh, we are we are not far away from oh, one yeah. division. Well, a couple sleeps, a couple sleeps left. All right, well, that's the episode this week, Mike. Uh, people want to know what you're up to, what you're doing, where can they find you at? Well, they can check me out at Mike Royer Design on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, and you can read my comics at pickledcomics.com Chris if people want to catch up with you see what you're doing where can they find you uh, you can find me on uh, Instagram Valdan87 or uh, Twitter Valdan V-A-L-D-A-N it's weird to hear you say TikTok it threw me for a loop there because <laughs> I know that's new yeah. uh, so. who knows how Who knows how long uh, that uh, that uh, promo that plug will stick around yeah, but we'll yeah, see I kind of <laughs> tripped on that one uh, so um, but yeah if people want to know more about our show what we're doing where can they listen to it at 
So easy. All you got to do is visit SuperHeroSlate.com. And what an archive it has become now, right? Like if you want to look up what happened on last year's Super Bowl, what trailers happened there, uh, you can check out our show notes. Uh, you, you just got to click back a couple. We don't really have like a search feature necessarily, but, you know, Google can search for you. I mean, that's what I did. So SuperHeroSlate.com, that is the best place to find all the avenues we host our show, like Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, and wherever else you love to listen to fine podcast check out our upcoming releases calendar if you want to see when are these movies supposed to come out because who knows they are still getting shuffled and dates are still changing but you can like us on facebook follow us on twitter and instagram you can get merch at superhero slate.com slash store we love hearing from you please reach out uh are you loving wandavision are you now fully engaged in it uh what was your favorite part of the Justice League trailer? And I want to know people's strategy. You know, are they going to rewatch the the Snyderverse before this one comes out? Are they going to try to go in fresh? I don't know. There's different minds, different thoughts there. But one last thing before we go, I forgot because I pulled it up because I didn't want to forget. In that WandaVision episode, when they're in that Halloween uh, town, mm-hmm. there's like a wacky inflatable arm flailing tube man. And I swear it looks just like the original Human Torch from the very first Marvel comic. You know, the one that's like an android and it's like all on fire. Um, I don't know if that was just like, you know, it's just a coincidence. But there, yeah, there's a wacky inflatable tube man that might be an Easter egg in that town square. I'll have to take another look. But I just wanted to say that before I forgot. Oh, well, they already introduced him in the first Captain America movie at the uh, Stark Fair as well. So it could be a throwback to that. You'll have to see. Hey, right, go check it out. I'm yeah, gonna have to rewatch. Maybe. I'm gonna have to rewatch these episodes. They're so good. So uh, we'll <laughs> catch you guys next week. All right, bye everybody. Thanks for listening, and don't forget to subscribe. Trust me, this is not a scary movie. <laughs>